Now I'm going to end with one of men's bridges before this, of course, the Ganter Bridge of 1980, which is a completely new form, which men invented for this uh, roadway up to the Simplon Pass. And uh, next slide. It's a design that is using pre-stressed concrete, and when men was finished with it, he realized what he had done. In his original early career, he had copied Maillard right side up, and here he copies Maillard upside down. So that's a joke. <laughs> Next slide. So here's men. He's telling this joke to Marie-Claire Bloomer Maillard, the daughter of Robert Maillard, who in another era, if, uh, uh, you know, if Smith College had had a had had an engineering program and she'd gone here, she'd have been an engineer. She wanted to be an engineer, but her father said, no, no, girls aren't engineers. You can't do that. So, uh, <clears throat> uh, so that's what, uh, but she was very interested in her father's work and in men's work. And so man is telling this joke to Marie Claire. You look at the expression on his face. Man is, 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 is from the Graubinden. People from the Graubinden don't run off the, the mouth. You know, they don't, uh, they're very, very taciturn, and so you have to read that look as one of sheer hilarity, this joke. <laughs> and, and, uh, <clears throat> but the person who would enjoy this scene the most would, of course, be Robert Maillard himself, the greatest of all the structural artists. And so the slide, uh, the wait, the, uh, the, this lecture ends with a final picture of Robert Maillard, wherever he is, in his costume of the structural artist, the master of discipline and play, Last slide, thank you very much. <laughs>
and the, uh, the difficulties of getting a form which didn't ripple when it was uh, extended like that. So it's, uh, it, it seems very simple, but you have to try it. And this is what Easter does. When he's working on a new form, it usually takes him about a month of just lonely work, getting it just right. And of course, what he's doing, of course, with the new form is he's trying to get it right aesthetically as well as technically. So it appeals to him as a form. So it's a good question because it is a difficult, it is a difficult procedure. Uh, but once, once you get it, it's, it's very effective. Good. Yes, sir. I'm curious, the, uh, with the thin shells, that there's a tremendous efficiency above ground, but then that has to be transmitted. There's a below ground component. It was, was there thought in terms of efficiently transferring those forces yes. to the ground rather than just pouring big blocks of concrete, for example? Well, you have to, when, when you come down, it's like an arch. There's a, there's a, a, you have to support the weight, but you also have to worry about the fact that it wants to spread. And you have to keep it from spreading by building a tie between the two ends and pre-stress that tie, holding it. So it's a delicate operation, but it's a rather standard one now. So it, which you're right, that's a very important, which I didn't really talk about, it's kind of hidden there. But that's a very important part of the operation, yes. Yes? It seems like this three generation of engineers went through quite a bit of discovering new forms for concrete bridges. Do you think there's still something left for us to discover? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is always, of course, the problem in any art, isn't it? That when you look at Picasso or something, you think he's exhausted all the possibilities. Well, uh, Maillard, at the end of his life, wrote an article. And what he said was, he said, was my work uh, that he had done up till practically the end, he said, my work is very crude. He said, the, 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 it's, uh, concrete has only been in existence for structures for about 50 years. Now, masonry was in existence probably a thousand years before the Romans did it. And they didn't get the really sophisticated, the most sophisticated uh, masonry bridges were the bridges of Pelonais in France in the 18th century. So Meyer was saying, there's lots and lots to do. But you have to think about it with a passion. You have to think about it as a designer and a builder all at the same time. And you have to be passionate about making it look elegant. And, and, and the, the, this is what his article's about. But what, would, what one could easily extend that based on what we see in this tradition is that it, the, I throw the ball right back at us, at the academics. Because if you look at the standard textbooks on concrete, you will see that there's none of this in there. There are now decorative pictures. Many of them will show the Salgini Tubal Bridge, but they won't analyze it. There won't be anything in there that says, that puts numbers to that bridge, even though I've published all that. So that in the teaching now, we are still, uh, and not just in the United States either, we are still blinded to the idea that it is a real art form. And that uh, the idea is that there's a state of the art and we follow it and we have a big building code, and the building code constricts us in what we can do, even though there are loopholes in the code, I mean built-in loopholes purposely. So it's a matter of people doing what these people did, these engineers coming out with a kind of passion for making forms, and they were none of them young when they made their great forms. They had to work their way through, they had to learn the field conditions. Sometimes we, and I was in the same position, are impatient. You know, we want to get out and we, want to, we read about these guys who are millionaires by the time they're 21. And we want to get out, we want to do something responsible right away, we want to be in charge of something and all. Well, these people were much more patient about that. They, they learned the field conditions, they learned the problems of society related to building. And by the time they had de developed that, and they kept thinking about what they could design, uh, and so there are a lot of features like that that I think are missing in education. Uh, that we concentrate too much on the so-called science of it and not enough on the design and art of it. Thank you. Yes? Well, you mentioned the code. And to what extent um, do codes restrict um, an engineer from being aesthetically creative? Well, I mean, in sort of in deepest principle, they don't. But 
In practice, they do because the codes are now very complicated. And in most schools, uh, the courses are built around the code. And they change every two, three years because you have a big code committee. Something happens in the field and they just they want to avoid that in the future. So they build some very big code restriction and so forth. And it becomes a big uh, issue so that um, so that uh, there's a, uh, I wouldn't say it's a, a, a necessarily a complete restriction, but it does have the effect, particularly in education, of deadening the kind of creativity. Do the bridges that we've seen the pictures of, do those, could those have been built in the United States? Well, of course, all the Amman ones were built in the United States, and the Zakem Bridge was built in the United States, and Men has many proposals uh, that because of his gradually gotten fame, uh, he has been called in by designers for many important bridges in the United States. But American designers are unfortunately very jealous of him. And they have forced him out of most of these cases. And Men is not a diplomat. I mean, and I said, you know, he go, looks at a project and says, completely wrong. Well, if somebody's going to great trouble to make a design and show it to men, and he says it's completely wrong, they're not apt to embrace him right away. <laughs> so it's a, there's that issue involved, and most of them, most of, so I think that that's part, whereas in architecture, you see, we've gone the other way around. If the guy isn't a foreigner, we don't give him a big project anymore, or something like that. That's exaggeration too, but this, uh, there's a, a much more openness in architecture to take uh, people from outside and bring them in. And I take, take one more question, perhaps, and then we'll adjourn upstairs. Yes. I mean, there's nothing extraneous in the Bunker Hill Bridge at all, but it is a different form. And you could, based on construction practice in this country, you could have made it less expensive by using a standard form. That's clear. It would have been less expensive. And the justification for adding something, which in this case wasn't men's, but the justification was they wanted to make something that was, uh, that was an elegant uh, statement of, of structure in a project which is all hidden. You know? And so they wanted to have something that was going to, uh, going to show off for all this money. So that was a justification for doing that. Now, if, if, men had, if you'd called men in and said, here's a, a tight budget, he would have designed a bridge which would have been a lot better than, than otherwise would have been gotten. It wouldn't have been that bridge. So it depends on what, what it starts with. And uh, that, uh, because he, he's able to do that too. All right, what was her? Well, let's thank Professor Bill for the